Well, today I want to welcome to you today my dear friend Brian David Anderson. He's been on several times before. He's an investigative researcher. He's an author. He's a very brilliant and eloquent man. He has taught me much, and I'm thankful that I've met him and been able to be his friend. And so I welcome you to the broadcast, Brian. Oh, good afternoon. Good to be here, Eric. <laughs> well, today um, we are going to be covering the Jesuit influence in the Far East. And uh, I'm sure we're going to need at least the, at least the remainder of this broadcast to, to cover it. So where you'd like to begin, uh, Brian, please begin. Well, let's go ahead and uh, we'll review again the uh, map that the uh, that you said at the top of the hour. If you're just now joining, is the uh, it's uh, www dot my god that's m y g o d the letter i the letter m so it's my god i am hit h i t dot com and then forward slash phuket p h u k e t dot html i lived in phuket in uh, 1978 uh, i was there for about a year and i am now in the uh, uh throes you might want to say of doing my autobiography and so i am now reviewing all the time that i had in phuket but what was interesting for me is i typed in two things and I encourage also anybody to do the same, and that is you can type in Phuket, Thailand, the, the history of Phuket, Thailand. It's a small little island south in the par, southwestern uh, part of Thailand. It's the very far south of Thailand. And you can type in, in internet, any Internet search, search engine uh, uh, the history of Phuket, and then... Uh, uh, you get all these different types of things coming from the tourist agencies and that type of thing. Then type in Phuket, Thailand, comma, Jesuits. And you get a whole nother type of history that comes up and really more of the true history because you have a whole series of authors that now have commented because it always then connects itself back into China. And the history of Phuket and also the Jesuits in China are all intertwined with one another. On this map now, you can see the black line is the, the, the ship route that how in 1566, when, uh, then, well, go back to 1534 is when the Jesuits were formed. And then, then they're uh, basically their oath taking that they were going to take over the world. And so China then being one of being the, the, the target, uh, if they knew that they were going to do anything in the Far East, China was where they needed to go. So here is how they then did their route. They had I, to go I, I, want, I want to add two things here, Mike. Good, please. Uh, the, the shippers for the Jesuits at this time were the Spanish and the Portuguese. Exactly. So they were using the Spanish monarch and the Portuguese monarch and his shippers to extend their influence. Okay. And, a, excellent point, because that's also, we'll get into Japan, and that's basically how they got into Japan, literally almost by accident. And so now you have the Spanish and the Portuguese with the Jesuits on board, and they had to go through Phuket coming from India. You see the black line there, and that's called the Ottoman Sea. So their first port in Southeast Asia was Phuket. Then they worked their way around, came to Singapore, and then up to uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then into China. And, of course, now they're, they're, they made their beeline and literally said, okay, they, they didn't drop any Jesuits off on any of these points. They went directly into China, and, of course, then they went into the – uh, major uh, port of, uh, not really port, but it was their major province of China, and that uh, being around uh, the Peking, Beijing at that time, and that was the banking, the very much influenced type of area, and of course then they had then Li Zhaojing uh, was their first per se Jesuit uh, type of trained individual. He came in about three and, or four generations. And, Go ahead. Let me make one point. The Macau, if, for the listener, the Macau was a Portuguese banking capital. Right. And that was very important. So this is a banking capital and also 
and also the Inquisition had extended to Macau. Right. So, so they had brought their evil powers <laughs> there and their banking. And, of course, Hong Kong is right next to Macau, which will have a significance with the British. Well, but now you had uh, more up the, also in the northern part of China near the, the Peking also is where they also had a lot of influence. And that's where the Li Jiaojing came from. Basically, three uh, uh, generations after the, the Jesuits came in, now Li Jiaojing starts to come into power uh, he, uh, and other persons like him. Which is also interesting, though, too, is as soon as the Jesuits then arrive, what else happened? There's crop failures season after season. Sounds like Ireland. Exactly. Sounds exactly. like what they did in Ireland. They had the potato crop failure, and they also shipped out eight freighters a day out of Ireland that starved the Irish, and a million Irishmen died, and many, many Roman Catholic Irish and fled the United and I'm, States. I'm sure if you also looked at the history of China, you would find the very same thing. But what was interesting, though, is as soon as the Jesuits arrived, you had season after season. Of crop failures, and of course, then now uh, you had the rise of Li Zhaojing, who is now Jesuit trained, and uh, again blaming all of the starvation, the uh, resulting famine, on the ruling class. Because and now you had Li Zhaojing basically just walking into with a 20,000 man force, and now deposing of the uh, monarchy at that time, and then you had uh, uh, the. Um, uh, uh, it's, uh, I again trying to pronounce the Chinese letters. I, I was uh, going to ask you, how do you spell Li Zhaojing? L I, L O, uh, and then Z I, C H A N G, Li Zhaojing. Okay. And then uh, the emperor that was put in, he that would, which is interesting about him, is that he uh, was a legendary type of warrior, but then all of a sudden he just disappears right off the map. Boom. It's like one day he is there, and then all of a sudden he just disappears. But then they, they had enough of his forces, people took over. Then you had uh, the installation of uh, X-A-I-C-H-A-N-G. Uh, that was the, the new emperor who was now installed into China. And again, he was very, very friendly. Quote, that's how the, if you look up in the books, and as I said, when you type in uh, the uh, country's name and say history of, but then if you make a comma on any search engine and you type in Jesuits, then you find something totally different. And uh, what you always see is that now this new, after Li Zhaojing does his revolution, they install a new emperor, but the emperor is very, very friendly to the Jesuits. And basically what they're also saying is that the Jesuits installed them and now they've got to control of them. Now you have, this is about 1662 that this new emperor comes in. Between 1662 and 1800, there is a tremendous uh, population explosion and also uh, economic boom that occurs in China. Okay, let, me, let, 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 let me add a couple things here too. Uh, at this time when the Jesuits are in China, they become the great astronomers for the emperor. Exactly. And, yes. and, in, and in Peking today, you can even see the old Jesuit globes and astronomy tools that they use to calculate um, new moons, to calculate the years. And because they were so adept in astronomy, this is what uh, made them so attractive and endeared to the emperor. And so the emperor bought them into his court. Well, but I think also there, because of also there's probably, it was a mutual thing there because there, the Chinese astrologers also and astronomers were very adept also, I think was probably more of a blending. Mm -hmm. And this is also too, is that there was a mixture of the two. And that's why, again, all of your telescopes today are all run by Jesuits and mm -hmm. owned by them uh, mm -hmm. because they, they see the importance of it. So now you had th this. Uh, and, one, and one more thing, the Jesuit order is portrayed in Star Trek as the Borg. Exactly. And they absorb all knowledge that they don't have into their order and then use it for their purposes. <laughs> and what is that? Uh, what was there also that uh, uh, their their final quote then is that... Uh, all resistance is futile. Is futile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, all, all resistance is futile, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
so then we have uh, now the, between 1662 and 1800, you have this tremendous economic growth that occurs in China. And also at the same time, you have a population surge. Until that time, uh, China was basically equal uh, population-wise to Thailand, to Cambodia. They were, it was all much, fairly much of a balance. But their true population explosion occurred during this time of profit. Uh, and also, why was it profiting? Because now the uh, Jesuits and with the British uh, 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 collaboration had total control over all opium all over the world. And you had the East Indian Trading Company, which basically, again, was all run by Knights of Malta. Uh, and now they're running all the heroin and well, basically your opium, which is the basis of your heroin all over the world. And again, we've uh, talked about this before, uh, that uh, a lot of your aristocrats and uh, the high society in Washington, D.C. was all addicted to opium that was run by EITC, which had a lot of other things we'll go into right now. But that's and, for and, example and, all over the world. And one more point. One other point here just comes up. Uh, for the listener, remember the Jesuits had control of the British Empire, of the British Crown, since no later than the reign of King George III. Right. From King George III to the present, the Jesuits have had total control of the British monarch, the British Crown, Old City of London, uh, the, their entire kingdom. So, and the gauge of that is also look at their title, and that was when their first titles that they all became either Dames of Malta or Knights of Malta. Uh huh. And you have that British branch of the Knights of Malta. Exactly. And, uh, and the other thing is that the uh, Jesuits used the, the British shippers, and the British shippers were the foremost shippers of the world at this time. They were not only using the British shippers for the, the opium trade, but they were using them for the slave trade. This is very important. And so the British now are the, in the 1800s, have replaced the Portuguese and the Spanish as the world's major shippers. And they're being used now by the Jesuits to subjugate China in attacking its population by putting it under this continual addiction of opium, making billions. And one of the families that's involved is the Russell family, the same family that was the one that set up Skull and Bones in 1832. So it just keeps on going. That's where, again, you can see the double cross, as we were talking about before, is that the Spain and Portugal were at one time the, uh, the king of the, of the seas. And then with treachery, they basically then were replaced by the British. And, and you know that uh, who was then responsible for that also, right. of, of the disposing. And again, there's no allegiances uh, when it comes to uh, what the Jesuits want to do. It doesn't matter. That's uh, right. what they're, the, the, the Spanish were at one time, and the Portuguese ran all of the Jesuits all over the world. Right. Then they were double-crossed. And, uh, and, and, the, and here's why. Here's why. Portugal, the, the king of Portugal expelled the Jesuits from Portugal and all his South American holdings in 1759. Yeah. Fr France expelled them in 1754, and Spain expelled them in 1767. So, well, a true it, it, expulsion now. A true expulsion. Yeah, these are true expulsions because the Jesuits then waged war on the French and the Portuguese and the Spanish during the Napoleonic Wars and then afterwards. So they're breaking up the Spanish Empire. They're breaking up the Portuguese Empire. And who are they using? The British. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where, again, it's, uh, again, uh, we talked about also between this 18, uh, 1662 and 1800, there was other monarchies that came into that were, quote, anti-Jesuit, but they really weren't. Brother Eric John Phelps, Biblical Truth and History and Prophecy. We're back with my guest, Brian David Anderson, noted author, researcher, world traveler, writing his memoirs, and researcher, world traveler, writing his memoirs, and we are reviewing now the Jesuit power in Southeast Asia, specifically through Thailand, into Singapore, to Vietnam, and then ultimately into China. I would like to also add that the Jesuits were the big silk traders and, and pearl traders in this area. And the Jesuits had their own fleet of ships called the black ships, in addition to using the Portuguese and the Spanish. And it's on their black ships that they brought every spice all the beautiful silks, the pearls, gold, all the riches you could possibly dream of back out of Europe, back out of China, through the Far East, and into Europe. 
And they used all this tremendous wealth than to be the world's international bankers, because the Josephs are, in fact, the order of the new Templars, the Templars controlling the world banking during the Dark Ages. And they would use their huge, massive fortunes to destroy the Protestant Reformation, to wage wars like the Thirty Years' War, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to further their goal of making the Pope of their making the universal monarch of the world. So, uh, back with you, Brian. Okay, and then we have now this <clears throat> tremendous growth in China, and then uh, at the same time now you have a population explosion, but by 1800 it starts to wane a little bit, and there's a little bit of uh, dissension, and so now you have this excess population, and you don't have that many jobs for the people. And at the same time now, a key thing happens in the late 1700s in Thailand, and the Burma as you can see north, they're always called Rangoon. Basically, they're not on the trade route. Hence, their influences in this area, especially the Jesuits, they kind of leave it alone for years. And so Burma still has a lot of designs on Phuket. Why Phuket? It's because there is a tremendous agricultural uh, opportunities in Phuket. The soil is just perfect for all sorts of types of crops. But underneath also the soil is one of the largest tin mines or tin ore in the the entire world is in Phuket. It's both uh, that whole island of Phuket is nothing but a huge tin ore mine, hmm. and so it's basically you have to do strip mining to do this. It's a it's a very slave labor, uh, very intense type of of. Uh, 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 endeavor to get the tin mine or the tin ore out and it's also there's offshore also mm -hmm. but now they weren't going to touch the offshore for a while basically now now is that the ties then uh, wanted to protect this so uh the uh, eitc the uh, east indian trading company the locals the jesuits they all banded together and when burma had sent a force down in 1787 to try to take over phuket they kicked them all out and basically now uh it, the thailand still was vulnerable so then thailand made deals with the Euro uh, the east indian trading company hence the jesuits and they let them control then the tin mining and also the farming of Phuket. And basically then if the, if the uh, uh, Burmese ever came back and tried to take over, basically then they would be attacking England. They would be attacking the Jesuits. So and basically then they basically then pushed off. And so there was no, basically it protected uh, the ties and protected Phuket. But the price was they had to give up all the economic control. Now, but the ties, again, they are Siam. It's a whole different type of race from China, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not Asian type of thing. It's kind of a combination mix. It's like between India and China. You had the Siamese, which were distinctly a racial type of group. Mm -hmm. But now the Siamese would ha didn't want to have anything to do with the slave labor of the tin mines. They knew that this was exploitation. So who were they going to dupe into getting to come here to, to, to tie it to Phuket? to do this. Well, now you had this excess population in China after 1800. And now they were they needed to get rid of this population. Otherwise, now this unrest of all these people unemployed. Hence, now you had them go to America and build the railroads. Yes, and yes, yes. I was just thinking about that. All the Chinese so now, coolies. Yeah, the Chinese yeah. coolies in California. That's basically, again, now you had two sets. You had, what we don't understand is that the, the, the number that was sent to America was probably around 200,000. People don't realize is that 600,000 immigrants from China were sent to Thailand. 98% of them ended up in Phuket as slaves, literally. I mean, we say indentured servants, but they were slaves in the tin mines. Now, again, you also had these Chinese men now that were ex exported over, and they weren't going back to China. There was no way they were told that they were double-crossed. Oh, yeah, you're going to work there for two or three years and come back. Well, they never did. They were never able to come back to China. Hence, then they then intermarried with the Thais 
in Phuket, and when you go to Phuket now today, it is d- dominantly now this mixture of Siam, Siam and also China. You go to Bangkok and you see totally a different type of race. Now there's been more infiltration up north, but when you, especially when you get to Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, up in the northern parts of Thailand, you really see then of what the Thais really look like, per se, racially wise. So now you had a mixture of races also in Thailand. But again, it was a very sweet deal is here was China having all this overpopulation and also unemployment and so now they are exporting literally exporting their people off to various parts another place that they also exported off to was uh, the plantations in South America people don't realize that there was also a big contingent of, of per se coolies and I don't with me the word coolies is uh, mm-hmm. I don't like that it's a, it's a racial type of thing but and that's well, it, well, it's, lack, it's, it's, lack of a better word to say that but the coolies were then sent all over not only to the United States but to South America and also as we said here to Southeast Asia and the other and thing, calculated move is that this also kept any type of revolutionary type of things against per se now the Jesuit controlled in China yeah, and uh, two thoughts. The they brought in lots of Chinese uh, slaves, for la- lack of a better term, to Panama. I was down in Panama. There are lots of Chinese down there, at least from from being uh, in years because they were the ones working on the Panama Canal. And who owns the, who runs the Panama Canal today? The Chinese. The Chinese. Too. Right. When I was down when I was down there last year, uh, we had a uh, a cab driver there, dear man, Manuel. And he obviously was, had some Asian blood in him because he looked very much uh, mm-hmm. Chinese, but a, a combination, say, of Mexican Chinese. And I asked him about the Panama Canal. He said, all run by the Chinos. The Chinos run it all. The Chinese. Mm-hmm. So the Chinese run it with Hutchinson Wimpoa. And the other thing I want to bring out is that the Jesuits are masters in race mixing. Mm-hmm. Because whenever you deliberately race mix a nation, as they're doing here... People lose their racial identity and thus their historical identity. Exactly. And, so, and so they're not going to want to bind together as a united people and militarily re- resist the oppressor that has come against them. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Well, now, again, we now turn to J- Japan, and the, uh, the, the first Portuguese ship <laughs> blew into Nagasaki. And uh, there, uh, it was actually a storm blew them in, and they had uh, Jesuits on board. And otherwise, it wouldn't have been for the storm; would have blown in. It was it was really kind of a bizarre story. But then the Jesuits made a very big stronghold in, in Nagasaki. Then they also made another one north of there in Hiroshima. And then the the, the Japanese uh, monarchy and the Buddhists realized after about four generations of what was going on, and that they were using this as a political means, not as um, you know. That's where again. They weren't trying to get more people into Sunday Mass. That wasn't the uh, that was not <laughs> at all. That's the, right. Uh, they weren't. Uh, that, that was not the goal whatsoever. That, that was that was like a, a secondary type of thing. So the whole thing was political, and they superficially kicked out the Jesuits. They killed a bunch of them, but sure. there was so much influence already at the time that it was already too late. And basically, it was more again of a um, a, a gesture to do it more than really actually to do any type of purging. Had they had to really do a purge, they would have to kill thousands of Japanese and also all along the way. But they just took out maybe 30, 40 Jesuits and basically the influence stayed there. Well, so well, Keith, well, if, I, if I might humbly disagree with you on that, for the listener's sake, um, the, that I covered in my book, I showed that they did kill, I think, around 20 or 25 Jesuits. I think they crucified them and it was just a, a public execution. But right. when, when Iatsu expelled the Jesuits in 1614, that was considered final, but they ultimately had to do that nobody could come into Japan, I believe around 1639. And the only ones they allowed to come to port in Japan were the Dutch Protestants because of Will Adams. And Will Adams was the Dutch, the English ship captain of a Dutch Protestant ship who warned the emperor of the Jesuits and who brought the British in to fight the Portuguese in a great big sea battle. And, and, and that, well, I believe about 30,000 Japanese were killed. So it was a big battle. And, the, and the, as far as I believe, it seems to me, the Jesuits were indeed ke- uh, kept out for about over 200 years until Commodore Perry 
and his gunboats come in in 1854 and forcefully open Japan to the British and to the Americans. And it's at that time that the, the Tokugawa shogunate is overthrown in 1867 because the Tokugawa shogunate was the abject enemy of the Jesuit order. They had to resign. They killed Emperor Komi because Emperor Komi was only 36 at the time, and he said, no white men are entering this country. We're not having any of these foreigners in here. And so he was assassinated, and they made his son, who was 14 years of age at the time, Emperor Meiji, and he ruled Japan for some 40 years. So based upon those things, I believe that Japan was a legitimate expulsion. And then look at the terrible punishment of the population of Japan during World War II. All the, fi all the firebombing, the detonations of nuclear devices on the ground, I'd say. It was just a total destruction of their culture so it could be rebuilt into this commercial colony for the Jesuits. Well, it's also, too, is that they resisted uh, doing any type of banking. Uh, mm -hmm. As in versus that of China when they first came in, is that the uh, even though you had uh, uh, certain emperors coming through, the, there was still a lot of banking that was done through the Vatican system in China. Basically, they resisted this banking as much as possible in China, and I believe that was also one of the key things is, is why then. But they had enough influence though then to. Fearmonger with the Hirohito and and the, and, the, and the late 1800s, then to modernize per se and, and phase out the samurai as far as being military in uh, Japan. And again, I believe that was a lot of it having to do again with if you look at the history of, of Jesuit influence of arming them. But the whole thing was, and, and Japan just fell into the trap, is that before even the first uh, person was uh, drafted in or they were using any type of modern warfare or the first bombs, there was already Japan was set up for defeat. Oh, yes, yes. J J and that was the whole thing, was to set them up militarily-wise. FDR comes along, uh, uh, then uh, calls an embargo on rubber and tin, of course, from, um, mm -hmm. from uh, Thailand. And that's when people don't realize is when uh, uh, Thailand uh, or when Japan bombed uh, uh, Pearl Harbor on that same day, uh, all of the Japanese who had come in, quote, as tourists and students and whatever, they had all these hidden weapons. They came in and literally marched into Thailand, uh, and they grabbed all their guns and took over Thailand. That's what, when I was there in 1978, I could only get a two-month visa. It's because, because of what occurred in World War II, they just rose up, these people, the Japanese that were already there in Thailand, and took it over. And that's where, again, that's when, again, the rubber and the agriculture culture would keep running and flowing to China or to uh, Japan because they especially needed that rubber. And so that's when the Japanese then rose up, took over Thailand, and even in 1978, uh, the most you could ever do was a two-month visa because of what occurred in World War II. Okay. So again, is that um, the uh, the whole, whole uh, uh, Japan, though, being set up, they were totally set up for defeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. And if I can, if uh, I can add to that, uh, the, the Jesuits, of course, then created their imperial empire with Emperor Meiji. Uh, Emperor Meiji then has a son. He's somewhat derelict. He's not emperor for long. Then you have Hirohito, and Hirohito is a Nazi. <laughs> yeah, I've right. seen I've seen the swastika armband on him when he went to England. Right. So right. So, so they set up this this uh, empire for a couple of reasons, and one of them being that they're going to use the Japanese military to destroy all the Protestant missions in China. Right. They're, going to, they're going to use the Jap and they And by the way, they didn't persecute the Jesuits, and I have that in a quote from the Jesuit Order's America magazine. Then they are going to be used to round up all the gold in the Far East and store it in the Philippines so that ultimately the American military can ship it all back to Chase Manhattan Bank and the big banks in New York City storing the gold for the Vatican. Which again, part of it didn't make. That was part also uh, the intrigue there of uh, the whole Philippine history is that a lot of the gold didn't make it back, <laughs> mm. and uh, it was an intrigue there. But again, now you had Japan set up, uh, and uh, basically again now we had we were the major influences of the Jesuits were Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Isn't that interesting? Is where quote the bombs quote went off and we right. discussed this before. Is how much more we got here a little bit? A few oh, yeah. is that we now have the uh, uh, what we've discussed many times before 
is that you had dirty bombs in the planes of the American planes. Yes. Uh, they dropped and they had magnesium and they had uranium on the bombs themselves, but they made a kind of a big blast. But the actual mushroom cloud that we see today was actually a electromagnetic pulse device on the ground yes. in the strongholds of Jesuit Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, exploded upwards. You had eight Jesuits near uh, eight blocks away from ground zero. They emerge out of a bunker and they say, well, the reason was because we were praying to the Virgin Mary. That's, That's right. Why we survived. <laughs> That's right. And even, and even Malachi Martin <laughs> mentions that in his book, The Jesuits, The Betrayal of the Catholic Church, how they emerged from ground zero, unscathed, no radiation problems, and attributed to the miracle of the Virgin Mary. Yeah. yeah so and, and by the yeah. way, for this, for this, the Pedro Arupi, who was there overseeing it all, was made Jesuit general in 1965. Yeah, so that's uh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, it just keeps on going. Then now, because we only have a few minutes here, is basically now you at the same time you had Mao Zedong, who was had many all of his whole family was nothing but connected to Jesuits. Uh, he was from a very rich family, but he was also just a pervert himself. I mean, just a really decadent type of person. He comes in, kicks out. Right, the whole that's right. We'll, we'll just tell the listeners. Uh, Mao Zedong was known for deflowering Chinese virgins one yeah, after another. one after another according to his own wife that was her admission yeah. so now you had uh the uh uh Deposing of the monarchies, you now had this strict control being put over. Uh, it's now papers now coming out that's just saying that the, the the Catholic Church was not persecuted. If you were a Buddhist, you were, but the Catholics then quote secretly. Now again, on a surface level, then Mao Zedong uh, d- deposes and he now kicks out all the Jesuits. In 1949. Yeah, right. but, who, but who takes all of their places is now the Knights of Malta. You have the left hand of the Jesuits yes. in the Vatican, yes. and now they're <laughs> supposedly kicked out. And now, but you have Prescott Bush, who is now uh, uh, George Bush's brother. He is a, one of the major shakers in China, yes. and so you have they were replaced by Knights of Malta. Yes. So and now you and, have. And, and by the way, yeah, Prescott Bush Jr. is a Knight of Malta. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So you, but he was also preceded by people. You also had Bill Donovan of the CIA, and you also had uh, 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 CIA, uh, but Donovan, but our other one, uh, uh, Alan uh, Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, right? Right. Alan Dulles, uh, both Jesuit uh, educated and controlled. They put in Mao Zedong. Okay. And so the commun- there would never have been any type of communism whatsoever in China had it not been for all of these historic facts. And then okay. you also had your concentration camps, you had your re-education camps, which were basically, again, modeled after Jesuit camps built in, in Nazi Germany, built in America, uh, Russia. Uh, Russia. 14, Russia. So basically, again, uh, we now have now China – supposedly being the model for everything and uh we now have vietnam uh it was really for me is it wasn't until i started doing all this research and five six years ago is that being a child growing up you would watch the the evening news and they had the buddhist priests come out they would douse themselves in gasoline and put a fire to themselves well being uh, uh, you know growing up in texas why are the buddhists doing that and you were never told that's right why that, because that, dir- that dirty, stinking, wicked sinner Walter Concrete lied to us every night. I can remember watching him on TV. My father was watching him every night talking about Vietnam. Yeah. Walter Cronkite never told us anything about that. And the other well, thing, and the, and the well, other think- thing, and the other thing is that uh, Fletcher Prouty said that the that the American Navy was used to bring down all the Roman Catholics out of North Vietnam, and they told all the Catholics that the Virgin Mary had gone south. So they brought the Catholics down so they could Argolite bomb the, the Buddhists in the north. That's where, again, is that you now had a very, still it was a minority of your whole South Vietnamese being totally all Catholic and being Jesuit influenced and Jesuit installed. And we never heard about the persecutions against the Buddhists. Well, why were they putting themselves on fire? We never were told, well, you had Jesuit dominated the DM and all the other dictators uh, that were for South Vietnam. They were, they were trying to do this genocide against yeah. the Buddhists. 
this, yeah, and yeah, we were never told this. Right, and DM, he had two brothers. It was his right. one brother was the head of the secret police, and his other brother was the Archbishop of Wei. Yeah. So now it's, uh, we, so Vietnam War would have never occurred. We also had the Cambodian uh, uh, deal uh, where millions of people were, were killed in Cambodia. Why Pol Pot, who was his mentor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, right. who was Zbigniew Brzezinski's mentor, Jimmy Carter, and Barry Satoro, a.k.a. Uh, Obama. So it just goes on and on. What's interesting now is what we have just a few seconds here. Now still the influence about China is that we now have Lieberman, who is now, uh, Senator Lieberman and another Republican that have come up with a kill switch for the Internet. And they want to give the, a kill switch to the Internet to, the, to whoever is president. And it's now they've now attached this amendment. They couldn't do it by itself, but they now attached it to a defense initiative. And they're saying that this thing's going to go through. But it's really interesting what Lieberman has said. The reason why they want to give a kill switch to the president of the United States is because they have the same kill switch in China. Mm. So they're now that the whoever the Chinese premier is or whoever their high people are, they have ability right now to kill the Internet in China. And that's his basis. He's saying, well, China has it. Well, why don't we? <laughs> A dirty, stinking Masonic Jew serving the Pope CFR member Joseph Lieberman. Uh, couldn't care less for the American people or the Jewish people in Israel, for that matter. Busy serving the Pope, implementing this tyranny. And, and, and according to the count that I've had on a couple of, um, one I used to have on every Friday regularly, he said that the Jesuit Council of Ten, the high ten Roman noble families, they all live in China. Right. right. <laughs> so protection. Yeah, protection. Right. So, again, there, we kind of give her a summary here of now we have the Trilateral Commission, we have the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, we have uh, all of your Rhodes Scholars, we have all of these people. What did they tout? What did they say is that what we want to install right now for world government and what we want to bring here to the United States is the China model. Mm -hmm. And what's the China model? It started off with Mao Zedong. And, we're, and then we go back all the way from that, all the way back to 1566, when the, Chinese, when the first Jesuits came to China. Had they not come to China, or if they had followed the king of Siam and kept them out, truly kept them out, mm -hmm. then our history, especially in Asia, would be totally, totally different than what it is today. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, Brian David Anderson, I want to thank you for coming on the program today. You always give me a, a whole bunch of new stuff and a further education. Vice versa, vice versa is that <laughs> the reason why I do is because there's always something new that you come up with that I don't know, and there's lots of things, little jewels. And again, highly recommend that if you want to really find out the difference between the cover stories and the real stories, type in Vietnam, history of Vietnam. And you'll find all this. Then type in Vietnam and then comma Jesuits. You come a whole different type of history comes up by really scholars who have studied the area. So I do the same thing with Phuket. You can do it with Thailand, Hong Kong. It doesn't matter. Is type in the two different types of things, and you get the tourist type of of thing. Oh, well, come tour with us, and here's all superficial history versus that of what's really, really gone on. And you really have true scholars uh, that have. Have gone into the history by just simply typing those two different titles in any ser internet search engine, you get a totally different view of reality. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Well, I want to thank you so much, Brian, uh, for your time and for your uh, uh, efforts in making these things known to the listeners, and hopefully uh, there will be a revival of nationalism in China, and the Chinese will kick the Jesuits out, and hopefully there'll be a revival of nationalism in America, most of all, where the Jesuits can be kicked out of here. And maybe we can have true nationalism once again where people can be loyal to their nation and build a country. Thank you for having me. Okay.